Thank you. Kia ora, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and spending some of your time with us at this uh, Spotlight Lecture. Uh, I want to thank uh, Melanie, Lauren, and Leah from our marketing team for making this possible. And I'm also delighted that Sophie Hanford uh, was able to join me in this lecture because uh, she is the future and I'm the history. Um, Sophie is the uh, councillor uh, from Kapiti Coast District Council. She uh, will have more to say about herself, no doubt. Uh, and I'm the um, head of School of Government at Victoria University of Wellington. The topic of the presentation is can public policy improve and sustain intergenerational well-being? My answer is an emphatic yes, but a highly qualified yes because if we are going to achieve this aspiration, I advocate and propose that it requires a radically different approach to the design and implementation of public policy. One that requires imagining big, large, but uh, thinking and doing small extremely well, and um, making sure that those small things that are done very well are properly connected and scaled up so they have the impact that's required of them. I'm delighted to share the conversation with Sophie because whatever we propose and pursue towards improving and sustaining intergenerational well-being requires her generation's deep engagement with both the processes involved and the outcomes that we aspire to achieve. Uh, one big theme is process matters as well as outcomes. Indeed, my main motivation for participating in this joint lecture is to provide wider background and context for just 10 minutes, as well as publicity in the exceptional work Sophie's generation are doing, while also giving her an opportunity to highlight the kind of support she and her generation need in order to succeed for the present and the future. The intellectual origins of the approach I outline here can be found in the book Small is Beautiful, a study of economics as if people matter, published in 1973 by Ernst Schumacher. The title, Small is Beautiful, came from a principle espoused by Schumacher's teacher, Leopold Kor, advancing small, appropriate technologies, policies, and polities as a superior alternative to the mainstream ethos of bigger is better. And that book was written and became one of the most influential books ever in a context exactly like ours, where there were severe, broader environmental, social, economic, and political pressures mounting around the world. Achieving sustainable intergenerational well-being requires, as I said, as much focus on processes as well as outcomes. By way of analogy, I show the following picture, which I have stolen from Professor Otmar Winkler, in a brilliant book, he's a statistician, he refers to it as a macroscope, as distinct from a microscope. This image is a composite of many small rectangular pictures, although each of them may represent microphenomena that are important in their own contexts. Together, they form a larger picture that is quite different from the many small pictures that compose it, like color stones composing a mosaic. While this joint picture is not very sharp, the intention of the image is clearly discernible. In an analogous manner, individual isolated facts and acts of communities across society together form the respective environmental, social, political, and economic phenomena that matter for our collective well-being today and into the distant future. The challenge is how do we aggregate and support them. There are thousands and thousands of uh, community 
activities going on even in our small country. I'll give one or two examples and um, Sophie will of course develop her own work uh, very briefly. One of them is coming from Wellington. A recently established Mental Health and Wellbeing Commission has reached out to hundreds of uh, community activities trying to find out what they are doing on mental health and trying to aggregate and connect them. The People's Project in Hamilton and Taranga deal with homeless people in very effective ways, very frustrated that they have not had the support to enlarge and upscale that. We have in Nelson the Tetarihi intergenerational strategy. The strategy has been culminating in thinking analysis and work that has been convened by the Waikato Incorporation in partnership with councils, iwi, local business, regional development agency, and so on, to try to bring all of them together to imagine a different future that will be helpful for future generations. And there are many, many more examples I can give. All these efforts around New Zealand that are very much focused on engaging with communities towards building resilience in the social, political, environmental, and economic domains have revealed one major gap. At present, there is no institutional infrastructure in New Zealand that connects and aggregates these efforts towards learning from each other, as well as exploring ways of increasing scale and impact and by connecting, raising the possibility of uh, accessing more funds. Nor do we have the equivalent of what works well-being in the UK that separates what works and what does not work in all these community trials so that we can support and scale up and fund what works. We have a micro image of it in the form of our impact lab it's a very small NGO kind of experiment, but it can be easily scaled up if we have the imagination. Going back to the figure on the screen, it is critical to note that the image that will emerge from the collection of thousands of such spontaneous self-organizations, spontaneous self-organizations, as Michael Polanyi refers to them, cannot be predetermined you cannot predetermine the picture that will emerge. Nor should we try to predetermine them if we genuinely believe that people have the right and communities to live the lives they value today and into the future. The distinctive role of public policy that is focused on enhancing well-being in a sustainable well, the way is to set up governance structures that will allow the aggregated image of these thousands of community efforts to evolve sustainably into the indefinite future without pre-design. That is, without predetermining the ultimate shape or destination or what will happen. The focus of public policy in that context changes from direction from the center to nourishment and support to enable people and communities to live the lives they value. This is the radical difference between policymaking with a social planner mentality, the mentality in New Zealand for as long as we can remember, and a gardener mentality, which is what I'm advocating. Having said that, although we cannot prejudge and predetermine the picture that will emerge from these thousands of activities, the gardener has a very distinctive role. It is to keep an eye on the health of the garden, making sure that its vital signs are looked after and no critical boundaries are crossed. I represent the well-being garden that the public policymakers should be watching from the moon or from the silos of Wellington in, the part, in this particular way, with the corners being the vital signs that we need for sustainability, such as environmental quality, social cohesion, and on it goes. Those are the key systemic outcomes that we should be monitoring, 
and we should make sure that we don't cross them. While at the same time, we are investing what's in the middle of the diagram, which I refer to as ecosystems, which are all focused on building resilience. If we do that, then the garden expands, the playground expands. And we have more space to play and live and pray and enjoy ourselves without crossing boundaries. This can be achieved through a set of complementary investments in the ecosystems that sit right in the middle, all focused on building resilience, having two dimensions, power to absorb pain and power to bounce back creatively from the shocks. This is where process becomes critical. None of these ecosystems can be strengthened in a sustainable well way without deep, effective and enduring community engagement towards building resilience. However, nor can they be achieved without appropriate macro level investments of the sort that the Infrastructure Commission and its likes should be monitoring and supporting. Legislation, infrastructures, looking across and saying what kind of legislation, say Resource Management Act, what quality standards should be imposed on water across the country, across health services, across education, Wi-Fi to support connectedness, and on it goes. That's the mind frame. What can I do to support, at a macro level, the kind of activities that are ongoing uh, throughout the country? We have some governance challenges to support these, and I enumerate them, and then I'll pass them on to Sophie. We have, as it happens, the Future of Local Government Review that provides a brilliant catalyst, initiated in April 2021, for reimagining the interaction between local and regional on the one hand, government and its communities, as well as the central government. What systemic institutions do we need to create to help us develop a holistic view of all the community level initiatives that are going on in New Zealand with a view to connecting and supporting them appropriately. What monitoring, evaluating and reporting mechanisms do we need to put in place to ensure that the collective impact of these changes is just and viable. Just, in other words, fair, equitable and viable. In other words, we don't cross any of the vital boundaries. In, a, in support of intergenerational well-being. I am not hallucinating such an institution exists in Wales, the future generations commissioner. What are the distinctive but complementary roles of central and local governance in this context towards ensuring genuine and comprehensive community engagement as distinct from consultation? The DPNC have issued a document about community and if you read it, it's all about consultation. They miss it. It's not about engagement, which is the critical issue. Not only vertical, but also horizontal engagement in identifying and prioritizing local opportunities and challenges. And finally, what funding mechanisms and supporting accountabilities do we need to put in place to ensure that these initiatives are properly resourced, evaluated, and scaled up if successful, and shut down if not. Think of the participatory budgeting charter of Scotland, and in our backyard, brilliant work, principal advisor New Zealand Treasury Ken Warren just published his paper on our website, Institute of Governance and Policy Studies, designing a new collective operating and funding model in the New Zealand public sector so we can appropriately fund such initiatives without compromising accountability or fiscal discipline. To summarize, I firmly believe that sustainable intergenerational well-being is absolutely possible. However, unless we have a change of mindset, we have a, in, an imagination, and we are able and willing to think and do things differently, it simply will not happen. Thank you. Sophie, it's yours.
Kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa, ko ai nui te kumonga, ko ai nui te kuawa nō paika kiriki a hau, ko Sophie Hanford tō kuingua, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Ko wai o, who am I? Ko Sophie Hanford tō kuingua, my name's Sophie, and as Skirol perfectly laid out the challenges and now handed it over to me to somehow describe to you and depict to you the vision for the solutions in 15 minutes, I don't think I'll be able to do that, but I'll give it my best shot from talking through some of my experiences, what I've learned from those, and how I think we can better strengthen intergenerational relationships, but also strengthen relationships across communities for change. So from primary school till now, and I will continue to hopefully be curious, that's one of the traits that I think a lot of us, well, I've even found this now being on council, I'm, I'm kind of, you start to lose it because you get so focused on all, all of these details around you and staying grounded in your curiousness, your curiosity, and also your why has been an extremely important thing for me to learn. But when I was 12, I remember very vividly my parents getting a letter in the mail from our local council, essentially setting out this challenge right in front of them. And this letter said, look, you live by the beach, climate change, sea level rise, you're going to need to think a little bit about your property. You're going to need to think a bit about where you're living right now. And I have this vivid memory of them sitting around the table when I was 12 and I asked them a question about what was in this letter. I was curious. And they started to explain it to me and I just felt this kind of sense of fear, almost this paralysis by fear rippling through me going, this is, this is my future. Yet I have not been told about this, I haven't been asked about what I think about climate change, about sea level rise, about what we can do to fix it, why not? And so I invo invited my local MP to speak to my class at 12 years old and put that question to him, very simply. I said, look, what are you doing to protect my future as a young person, to protect this collective planet that we share, that's our home? And he said something along the lines of, well, that question would be better put to our climate minister. Maybe you should ask him. And I thought, no. Nope, sorry, I'm not taking that because actually, if I feel the sense of fear, I'm part of your community, so you, you are answerable to me and to my generation too. So that kind of then led me down this path of trying to be curious, trying to understand why we're in the situation that we're in and what I can do to be a part of the solution. In high school, the same thing. Got involved with Eco Action Group and started trying to do my bit and found little opportunities too, but when I left high school I thought, well I'm not actually going to go to university because I don't know what I can study that will give me any more than what I already kind of know we need to do and we just need to get down to doing the mahi, to doing the work. I think a lot of us are grounded in and understand what needs to be done. So just as Girol said, what's actually stopping us? And I think mindset is a lot of that and also getting caught up in a whole lot of process and getting caught up in a whole lot of stuff that actually when we strip things down, what is actually needed to get us to the outcomes that our communities and our planet so desperately need. Not for us, without us. That's how, a little bit how I felt sitting around the council table being the only councillor under 40 and we're talking about our long-term plan. We're talking about a vision for Carpeti in 20 years. But I'm the only person, I'm 20 now, I'm the only person under 40 that's sitting around that table being able to vote and really have a say about our long-term vision. We only had one primary school submit to our council and that's because the resources weren't put aside to have that engagement with schools. But instead, that money was put towards engaging with businesses was put towards engaging with residents associations, was put towards engaging with groups like that. But long-term planning, how can we have a conversation about long-term planning when we do not have not only the future of our country and our world at that table, but I would also encourage you to think of young people as the here and now too. We're all the here and now. We're all here in this present moment, which means we all have a responsibility, but also an opportunity to be a part of the solution. So, so I guess what kind of grounds me in all of that is my why. And as we scale up and as we have conversations about how things need to look in the future, how processes need to, look, need to look to deliver public policy that's suited to our people, our diverse communities and our planet, I encourage you all to think of why for you this is a really important plight and fight to be involved with. 
So my why is wanting to know and say that I did absolutely everything in my power to ensure that the world we're passing on is one that's livable, beautiful and sustainable. One where balance between us and the environment is restored. So I'd encourage you to think of your why as we have these conversations, these quite challenging conversations about how we do scale up and also how we scale back. I think too we talk a lot about scaling up, growing things, you know, focusing on where we can get more resource from to put it somewhere else. But actually what I found, and I'll touch on a few stories, is that simplicity, I truly believe, is beautiful. And similar to what Girl said as well, looking at those small pieces of the puzzle is beautiful. And mindset can shift all of that. So back in 2019, at the beginning of 2019, a few friends, friends and I got together and we said, okay, we've got this kind of fear that we feel deeply in our hearts and our souls about the kind of future that we'll be passing on to the next generation. How can we do something about it? So we rallied a few of our friends and started the school strike for climate movement here in New Zealand. And very quickly, and without a whole heap of money, um, without a whole heap of, of kind of support in the beginning, and actually with quite a bit of pushback from, from people in, in our communities and from um, people who we actually needed the support of, we managed to mobilise 170,000 people in September. That's 3.5% of our entire population for climate justice. We organised that strike on less than $2,000. We managed to have a network of about 40 people across the country having only met each other once. And all of that we were able to do on Zoom. I never thought it was possible. Probably many of you would have never said that was possible if a group of us from the age of, ages of eight, 8 to 21 we're here in front of you saying we want to organise a strike for climate justice and we want to mobilise tens, potentially hundred, hundreds of thousands of people. But we did it. And there were eight-year-olds involved with that. They had just as much of a say and actually they had incredible things to bring to the table because they represented their own perspective and their own viewpoint. But we kept it real simple. We just said, look, if you want to be a coordinator for your region, go for it. Here are some resources, but you know, we trust you. Just make it happen. So we kept it real simple. Team of all ages, little budget, completely new movement. Council, the team that I had that helped me to get elected to council, none of them could even vote for me. They were either too young or didn't live in the ward in which I was running. And I won by more votes than both candidates had combined. And so no one would have said that was possible, but we knew that we wanted to try. And we knew that if we just kept the campaign simple, a simple message, but a message that had truth and was grounded in a why and that we could clearly articulate and that we had a vision. You know, we, we didn't know how far we could go, but we thought we could go pretty far and we, we believed in that. And so now I'm actually on council and I'm finding that there's, there's so much noise, there's so much talk and there's, there's so much, it's so dense. All of the information we're receiving, it's so dense and all the conversations are too and there are elements of that which I love. But I also think back to how much has been achieved and how much will continue to be achieved by small groups of people with not a lot of resource who are just truly passionate about what they do. And so I say all power to those people and all power to those groups and all power to the knowledge that they bring. Because that was something I was met with a lot by people who were older than myself. We did a whole lot of door knocking on my council campaign. And the main thing I was met with was, well, it was either, oh, how old are you? And I was like, oh, I'm 18. Oh, what are your credentials? What have you studied? You know, what kind of real world experience do you have? And actually, I, I kind of almost thought to myself, well, I've, I've come up against some pretty challenging things. Um, and there are lots of young people who have. And especially being a young person in this day and age with the impacts and the, the kind of um, I guess effects of technology and, and the, the density of information too available to us at the tip of our fingers and social media and, and this age of comparison, I, I kind of just said, you know what, I actually do have valid experience. So I think part of this is about young people kind of being able to stand in that and go, yes, we do have, we are, we are valuable, we are valid in this conversation, listen. And that's what I'm finding in council, is I do have to exert that, otherwise I will just continue to be pushed to the sidelines, but I'm not willing to let that happen. But we do need to make sure these spaces are prepared well so that young people are in there able to contribute in the way that I think we best know how, I best know how anyway. 
So, how do we collectively and intergenerationally move forwards and scale up? This is a big question, a very big question. I think we're aware of what needs to happen. We're aware of potential ways that we could, we could scale up. And there's, there's real kind of excitement and hope, I think, that comes from that. I think it's easier than we think. I think it's just all about priorities because we have a limited amount of time, a limited amount of energy. What do we actually want to prioritize? And that's truly up to us. We hold all of the power. And that's something that we can forget is that actually in these crises that we're up against, the climate crisis, the youth mental health crisis, as a society, we actually hold all control. So, so what, what really is stopping us? In terms of youth being involved in these conversations and for them to really happen intergenerationally, we need to trust that young people have solutions, that young people have valid and valuable knowledge and understanding to bring to these tables. And we also need to learn, I think, how to better pass the mic and how to better create and seed opportunities for people who who might not have the same perspectives as us, but knowing that that'll in turn help the end goal and the outcome in the end. We need to invite people to the table. We need to bring people into the movement. We need to truly think of this as our collective home and not just a home of one generation, not just a home of one race, not just a home of one specific demographic, but actually we all are sharing this space like we are right now. We're sharing, sharing this space. To scale up, we need to focus on the why, because you can believe in the why. And if we want to bring people in and be able to scale up our collective effort and momentum, then people need to understand why and what they're getting to be a part of. And the vision and the dream needs to be sold. And that's why I think Girol's incredible well-being garden is a great first step to that, because you can see it. So often we talk about well-being, we talk about uplifting people's mana, we talk about enabling, we talk about empowering people, what does it look like? And so I think we need to have that dream, that vision that we can help to sell to people. We need to step into our own individual responsibilities as well because I think that individual responsibility, individual responsibility, individual action is all part of collective action. So if collectively we want to move forwards, we have to be taking steps in our own kind of life and within our own worldview to make sure that we are able to see the world through a lens that recognises the perspective and the, the vibrancy that every, every person brings to the conversation. For the most part though, I'm sure that many of us do know why we do what we do. And I truly believe though that to move forwards and to scale up, we do just have to strip things back a little bit. We actually just need to go, okay, what are we, what are we not going to do to be able to move, move us forward? What processes actually aren't helping us to achieve any of these key indicators for well-being? Maybe they're you know, causing detriment, maybe they're not, but what, are, what aren't actually assisting us? So for me, thinking about how we move forwards and scale up, I, am only, I only bring one perspective to this. And I recognise too um, that there are many people of many ages who would have their own kind of belief or understanding of what moving forwards and scaling up even looks like. But I think we need to, like I said, learn how to better pass the mic and create space for solutions that might be different to ours. And whether that's, you know, better understanding how to do that, um, whether that's better understanding how to enable others, whether that's understanding how to focus and communicate our own why, whether that's figuring out what youth movements are happening in your community and going, how do I support you? Actually reaching out to them and asking whether you can hear what they have to say and how you can better support them. Um, I think it's a journey for all of us. And to collectively and intergenerationally move forwards though, we need to know and hear from a variety of people within our community. What kind of ancestors do we want to be? There are massive conversations at the moment, as Gero mentioned too, the local government reform, the future of local government, 
There's conversations about our long-term plan, about long-term plans across many districts in Aotearoa. And this is a question I'm constantly asking myself, because I think if we're truly, if we're truly thinking intergenerationally, we have to think about the legacy that we will be leaving to the generation that inherits this planet from us. Because I sometimes get into this mindset of going, okay, well, I'm here right now, and I can make a difference, and it'll be great, because then when I bring people maybe into this world, then they will be able to enjoy this planet that we've all created and that vision that we've had and that we've had the willpower to actually create. But there's life beyond that, hopefully. There's generations that will follow for, you know, hopefully hundreds, thousands of years if, if we're able to get the planet in shape before then. But if in our own minds we believe that things are possible, I believed, I truly believed that the School Strike for Climate Movement could be powerful and we've shown that we were and that we will continue to be. I didn't know if I could get elected to council, but I knew I just had to try. And sometimes we just have to, to try <laughs> and just to know why we're doing things and to know the importance of it because we don't have long to be a good ancestor. We only have a limited amount of time on this planet and if we truly want to, to do what we can, now's really the only moment. So, things, things will be hard. Um, things are challenging. But again, I think keeping it simple and being able to stay grounded in our why is, is one of the only ways that we're going to move forwards because otherwise we just keep on adding to this, this kind of dense environment of information and the anxiety that people already feel about the current state of our world without a vision to move forward. I don't think that's going to get us anywhere. So if we can all be a part of creating that in some way, shape or form, what that looks like I think is a combination of you know, indigenous knowledge who have people who have known how to live in balance with the planet for many, many years in conjunction with the voices of young people who, who have this kind of, I've found anyway, sitting alongside young people who, who think beyond constraints. And that's what we need to do. That's the way we need to be thinking. Keeping it simple but allowing ourselves to think beyond constraints. So I found that hard to answer and hard to process in my own mind, but hopefully that's given you some things to think about. Um, there's so much that's possible, we just have to believe it. And we can truly be good ancestors if we believe and understand the ways of doing that, and there are many. So I would just encourage you all to step into the responsibility that, responsibility that we have to do that. And yeah, kia kaha in that journey and support one another. And across generations, I can tell you that it's in our best interests as young people and also in yours for us to be a part of this journey together. So thank you.